And so the question is, okay, if, if regulatory requirements provide, you know, what must be done, where do standards fit in? Um, and really, these are giving more details. These provide the best practices that are needed to achieve the broad regulatory requirements. Um, and so it breaks down those industry best practices into more specific requirements to be met. Um, a lot of times they'll follow a life cycle based approach. So if they list out every um, key step and you go you know, step by step through a methodology, you're less likely to miss something. Um, we'll see that a lot of times prescriptive standards address known mistakes explicitly. So um, you know, let's say that there is a um, an elevator company and or, or some elevator examples where the stopping distance for braking um, routinely wasn't fast enough. They may have specific requirements that says, you know, the braking distance shall be X uh, based on the height of the elevator. There are different things that would be explicitly included um, to prevent those um, known mistakes. Um, and, and really, they help to identify those actions to move from you know, where you start closer to a, a tolerable risk. Um, they can also help to provide consistency across organizations. Um, and we'll see, you know, certain standards have requirements that apply to, you know, the OEMs and the integrators for designing the functions. And then include requirements like the information for use or again, those information transfer points where that has to go from the, you know, manufacturer, to the owner operator. Um, and so again, that's a key thing where we need to address both of those aspects and having standards that you know, cover the full life of the machine help to, to make those, um, you know, make those information transfers more smooth. Um, and then lastly, by following these standards, this then gives a defendable position that all reasonable steps were taken. Um, and, and this a lot of times becomes the basis for a legal defense in the US where you can demonstrate that you've actually taken reasonable precautions, that you've followed the industry best practices um, and that you've applied them correctly. Um, and that, you know, although unfortunate accidents still do happen, um, that you really have taken everything, you've done everything that you could have reasonably done. If we look at um, the, the common standards uh, for the European machine safety, um, you know, 13.849 and IEC 62061 are both referenced by the machinery directive um, as a way to, again, show that those requirements have been met. Um, so those are really at, at the core, at the center. Um, ISO 12100 will focus on for the risk assessment and risk reduction process. Um, that is a, another key piece. And then there are a number of um, different EN documents um, on specific safeguard types, um, as well as for specific machine types. Um, so we've got a, you know, an idea of, let's say, the environment of the um, kind of the, the center of the standards, and then um, you know, let's say increasing radiuses going out. Um, and to help define the um, European standards, there are three different types that are talked about. Um, and I think what we'll look at here for the, the core safety concepts, um, you know, this really, let's say, will we'll stay true as the, the standards evolved. Um, but we've got type A standards, which are at the, the top are, are the broadest, um, and those give basic concepts that can be used in many applications. So, um, you know, IEC 61508 would be an example of a, a basic functional safety requirement standard. Um, for electronic and programmable electronic systems. Um, and I can see, sorry, so so this should say basic standards and then functional safety should be the, the next row down. Um, and then from a, a machine safety specific standard, um, ISO 12100 is the basic concepts um, and principles for design, risk assessment, and risk reduction. Um, and so, this is, these type A standards are not going to be referenced in um, the machinery directive because they're too broad. We just, if we, if we keep going through, so the type B standards, um, these would include things like ISO 13849 and IEC 62061 as two examples. Um, and the harmonized versions of these are referenced for um, the machinery directive. 
Now, the type B1, these are generic group safety standards for safety aspects. Um, and then the B2 would include things like um, systems and safeguards. Um, and so these are just some examples of the, the standards from the previous slides falling into those, those two different categories. Um, and so think, you know, type B is more specific than type A. And when we get to type C, these are the most specific where you're looking at um, individual machine groups. Um, so specific requirements for elevators or specific requirements for um, you know, woodworking machines would be the types of things that you would see in um, a type C standard. Now, one way of, of categorizing the standards is, you know, what type of standard is it? Uh, another way is to say, well, what is a prescriptive standard um, or a performance-based standard? So prescriptive standards give a clear design to follow. Um, so they may say, you know, thou shall use sensor type X in a one out of one or a one out of two configuration to go to your logic solver to go to an output. Um, and you must implement these five safety functions for food processing machines. So that could be an example of a very um, prescriptive standard. And those are good for specific applications. Um, but if you have something that deviates from that application that that standard is based on, or if you have a unique or a novel machine design, um, then the prescriptive standard is really going to fall down and is not going to help you meet your risk goals. Whereas performance-based standards define clear safety requirements. So they say you know, what you must achieve from a safety standpoint, um, but you don't have a single design for how to achieve it. Um, and so that specific design or that architecture um, can vary as long as you evaluate it and demonstrate that it meets the requirements. Um, and it gives you those methods for verifying that your achieved design is adequate. And so something that you know, we, we very strongly recommend and it is a key to look at is that prescriptive standards should always be paired with a performance-based standard to make sure that tolerable risk is met. Um, because even, you know, when it applies to a given application, you know, it's going to have lots of really good guidance. It's going to help you avoid some specific mistakes, but we always want to make sure that we're going back to that risk-based approach um, and that we're making sure that our tolerable risk criteria is being met. And so um, that's where, again, we, we need to make sure that those performance-based aspects are included as well. If we look at the, um, you know, some of the common things that are referenced for U.S. machinery standards, um, you know, we can think about the the OSHA regulation in the center, um, the NFPA 79 documents that we looked at um, in the past. This was really one of the the core standards. Um, there are some ANSI documents as well with specific guidelines, um, and again, we also have. Uh, more prescriptive standards for specific machine types um, and specific applications. And so what we'll think about is what can we pick as the right groupings of standards to use together? Um, we want to you know, pick our overall standard that's going to drive the life cycle approach. We want to take advantage of um, specific uh, prescriptive standards for a given application. So if we're you know, doing a packaging system, you know, we are going to want to look at the, you know, packaging machinery requirements as well as, you know, what steps we need to take to, you know, design a system that meets a given SIL or PL. So those are, you know, things that we can think about pairing together for our approach. Mm -hmm.